So howdy and welcome. I'm Dr. Sarah Witham Bednars, a professor emerita from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. And I'm the first of seven geographers that are going to be providing you with a faculty lecture to conclude each of the units here on AP Daily. I should start by saying that my research specialty is geography education. That is studying how people of all ages learn to think geographically. And if you're interested in looking at some of my research, you can find me on Google Scholar. Now, I know that you've spent the last few weeks examining the key ideas, principles, practices, and skills of geography. You might feel a little bewildered. Learning a whole new way of thinking or seeing the world is not easy and especially under current stressful circumstances. So let me let you know what you're experiencing is natural according to research in the learning sciences. So let me start my slides to provide you with some textual information to accompany my comments. There are three types of knowledge. First is what we call declarative knowledge, knowledge about concepts, principles, and facts, knowing something like what does time-space compression mean? Second type of knowledge is procedural knowledge, which is all about knowing how to think, that is the procedures by which someone applies concepts and understandings. When would the concept of time-space compression be a tool to analyze a particular relationship? for instance. And the third type of knowledge is termed conditional knowledge, knowing when and under what circumstances or conditions to use or apply both declarative and procedural knowledge. So knowing that there are these three different discrete types of knowledge should help you to understand why you might be having a challenge at learning to think geographically at this point in your learning course. You've launched into all three types of these knowledges at once, which is a lot to grapple with. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance going on in your heads. You have been introduced to a toolkit of guiding spatial concepts that you'll employ throughout this entire course. Concepts like space, place, pattern, flows, and how interactions occur across space and time. These are examples of declarative knowledge. Thinking about space, first of all, though, how is especially new to most students. We are used to thinking chronologically. We think in terms of birthdays and first year, second year, and change over time, however, and, and, and the like. But we don't think about space and place and the role it plays in our world at different scales in the same way. However, we do use spatial concepts all the time in our daily life. If you're playing a sport like soccer or, or football or hockey, you have to know where you are on the field in relationship to the other people in other parts of the field. When you navigate a new territory, a new town, a new high school, a new whatever building you're in, a new environment, you are applying your spatial understanding of spaces and place to navigate from one place to another. And oftentimes we use spatial concepts as organizers for our intellectual thinking. If you make concept maps to link ideas amongst each other in a visual, uh, that's thinking spatially and thinking geographically at a different scale. And in this semester, you, at the beginning of the semester now, you have been asked to think with and through maps, what we might call spatial analysis, following certain procedures as well as using your new understandings of pattern and space and place. I make the distinction between thinking with and through maps as part of the skills that you're learning in this course. And these are all both examples of procedural knowledge. Remember, maps help us to visualize and see what otherwise might be invisible. That is thinking through maps. Maps also help us to understand the relationships that we might not re realize otherwise, which is thinking with maps. Maps, especially thematic maps and other spatial representations 
like satellite images and graphs like population pyramids act as support systems to analyze and solve problems. And you've also begun to understand the world through the data and the information that you gather about it, both qualitative like field observations and interviews and landscape analysis, gathering textual information and quantitative information, things you can count. This information is all geospatial data, data with precise locations attached so they can be organized using geographic information systems. And knowing how to do this, what data and what information using what procedures and under what conditions, that is, using all three types of knowledge at once, takes practice. I just wish to assure you that you are learning a new way of thinking, and it is a challenge, but it will get easier as you develop fluency in geography. But how is it that you can learn to think geographically? What does it mean to think geographically? So my purpose today is to examine just this question. How is it that geographers think and see the world in a comprehensive fashion? First, I wish to discuss how it is that geographers themselves characterize the discipline of geography. Next, I wish to introduce you to the idea that thinking like a geographer offers you a valuable set of advantages in addressing current issues at different scales of analysis. And I'll be using redlining in Los Angeles as a case study to examine the so-called geographic advantage. But most importantly, along the way, I would like to make the point that geography is not just a course, although it is a course. Studying human geography and our sister discipline of physical geography could possibly be a powerful tool, a habit of mind that you can use your entire life, maybe even in a career. So to begin, in essence, there are two pers key perspectives to the discipline of geography, the spatial perspective and the environmental perspective. We're gonna talk about the spatial perspective first. Geographers focus on the spatial dimensions of human experience captured by the concepts of space and place. We ask where and why there and why not somewhere else to understand spatial relationships at a range of scales. Now this is a map of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I'm talking to you from right now. You might see the blue dot on the left side of the image close to the Rio Grande River, which is my absolute location. But the scale is only useful for some geographic uses. We would want to zoom in to, this, to the same kind of area to see what, for example, the layout of streets is, um, recreational facilities, uh, neighborhoods, um, business locations, uh, major highway intersections. And then on top of this, we could layer information such as income, ethnicity, access to transportation, school locations, supermarkets, recreational facilities such as parks to examine questions about community health, resilience, access to services and other kinds of questions, community-based questions. Or as geographers, we might wish to zoom out to observe what's happening at a regional or even a global context, noting, for example, the location of key cities in a region such as Phoenix and Denver and Amarillo. And, and then to begin to look at the kind of equal at area distance between all of these places uh, and to begin to ask questions about why do we see this kind of distribution of major urban areas the way we do and, and connections and spatial relationships between and among these and the role of transportation, of course. But it all starts by looking at patterns the patterns of human activity on earth, where people live, where cities are located, where we grow crops, what crops do we grow where, to understand the processes that drive and produce these patterns. Processes like migration, the flow of people across space, as shown in the graphic on the left from the United Nations. And processes like urbanization, the growth and development of settlements into cities, 
and specific processes affecting these growth patterns or decline patterns. Um, to ask questions about why, for example, we see from this image of Sao Paulo uh, on the right, uh, why it has developed the density it has, it, it has and, and why is it developing it growth, growing up rather than growing across space. And considering another process, how technological innovation and like changes in transportation, improvement in transportation technology, and the growth of communication technology, such as the internet, affect economic development and globalization. But geographers also, more than any other discipline, look at the interactions between and among humans and the environments in which they live. Humans are only one part of the living system of Earth. We depend upon the environment to provide food, shelter, water, and a range of other natural resources. And we modify the environment to suit our needs. We drain swamps, we cut down forests, we alter waterways, and create new ones, all with an impact on the various ecosystems upon which we depend. And we as humans adapt to the environments in which we live. Many of our various cultural practices that you're going to be learning about in forthcoming units um, are the results of humans adapting to a range of environments. Now this picture is of Albuquerque looking north towards Santa Fe, where you can see how people have modified the environment, planting crops, controlling the flow of the Rio Grande, upon which we depend for irrigation and drinking water, constructing settlements, and creating green spaces to preserve ecosystems. We humans interact with the environment at a range of scales, from the very local to the global. So this interaction, dependence, modification, and adaptation, these are the processes, the connections, and relationships among living things and human societies that make up the environmental perspective. So back to my original question, how do geographers think? The famous geographer Carl O. Sauer termed our way of seeing the world geographically, spatially, and environmentally, the morphological eye. And by morphological eye, he meant the study of morphology, which is the shape of something or the form of something. When we study geomorphology, for example, we're studying the shape and form of the earth, geomorphology. But morphology, as geographers say, has, um, excuse me, as Sauer said, geographers have this morphological eye, a spontaneous and critical attention to form and pattern. He further characterized geographers as having a specific habit of mind, or what he called the geographic bent, that manifests itself by, among other things, liking maps, enjoying travel, a curiosity about why things are where they are and how they are, and an appreciation for landscape, both the natural environment, natural landscapes, and human-shaped, human-built environments and landscapes. Thinking geographically thus, according to Sauer, includes observation with an eye, taking perspectives, looking to seek differences and similarities, likeness and unlikeness in the world. Try thinking like this to begin to think like a geographer. Let me give you some practice. Take a minute and look at this image. This is actually a composite of satellite photos or images produced by NASA. And it shows, in essence, population distribution in Mexico, Canada, and the United States, parts of the continental United States. First, where are you on this image? And if you're not on this image, I apologize. But what patterns can you see? Where do people live? Where do people not live? Where are there clusters of people living in densely set in dense settlements? Can you observe linear relationships in the distribution of settlements in cities? Are there distinct connections between population clusters? 
What might be the environmental factors that limit dense settlements in parts of the American West, except in certain areas? What role might landforms play in the distribution of population? These kinds of spatial and environmental questions will become second nature to you as you continue to learn to think geographically. Or examine this cultural landscape. What do you see? What clues about this place can you gain from analyzing this image? What about the style of architecture? What kinds of building materials are being used? Can you tell anything about the cultural heritage of this place from looking at the architecture and the kinds of building materials that are being used? Where do you think this might be? Can you observe any spatial patterns or trends in this landscape? What kind of space might this be? What kinds of activities might take place in such a space? How do you think the people shown in this image feel about this place? What kind of a sense of meaning do they have? Is there anything symbolic about this particular landscape? When you ask such questions, you are thinking geographically. And for those of you who don't know, it just happens to be the town square in Krakow, Poland, which is used for ceremonies, markets, demonstrations, and a range of other social, political, and economic activities. But it's with a sense of urgency that I wish to kind of shift tone here for a minute. We do live in uncertain times, that's for sure. But thinking geographically is a powerful tool given some of the tremendous challenges our world is facing. Our planet is changing. We're using more and more resources and thus increased consumption is affecting our ability to sustain our way of life. The population is growing and is more mobile than ever. Geopolitical tensions are on the rise globally and in our own country. And climates are changing rapidly, but with uneven geographic impact, creating challenges that geographers and policymakers are struggling to understand and address. But just as this might be the worst of times, it may also be the best of times. It's a time of great geographical innovation. We have new tools and technologies, global positioning systems and geographic information systems and the science behind these, these tools, geographic information science. All of these advance the study of topics such as sustainability, environmental change, globalization, and population dynamics. We collect and can analyze huge amounts of data in real time to understand events across the globe, feeding information hierarchically up from the local level and down from the global level. Certainly, we have seen this playing out in the COVID pandemic of 2020. Dynamic maps and images fueled by powerful spatial and geographical data have become essential to track the spread of COVID-19 and to make decisions about where to distribute medical supplies, testing kits and emergency services, as well as when and where to reopen businesses, schools and industries. But again, you might be asking, so what? The so what to me as a geographer is that geographic thinking is powerful and that it offers advantages to addressing a range of important issues like the ones we've just reviewed. The idea of geographic advantage was suggested by Dr. Susan Hansen, a leading feminist geographer from Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. She noted that there are four aspects of geographic thinking that offer geographers an advantage in approaching problems that other scientists do not have. Let me explain them to you briefly. First, geographers contribute to solving issues by understanding the relationships between people and the environments in which they live. That is by employing the environmental perspective, which we just discussed. Second, geographers understand the importance of spatial variability, which means the conditions vary from place to place. Some places are densely populated, some places are not. What happens in one place may not occur in another place. This is the idea of the place dependency of processes. Third, 
geographers understand that processes like urbanization and economic development take place at a range of scales, but that they are all interconnected, that a local process can feed into large scale processes, while large scale processes feed into local processes. A global regional uh, economic, excuse me, a global economic upturn, for example, um, downturn may have an effect on local regional economies, while a regional economic downturn may play into or reverberate at a global level. So what happens in one place is going to be connected and affect other places, a range of scales up and down. And finally, geographers understand that key processes play out in two dimensions, both across space and in time. Change or chronology is a key idea in geography. Change occurs over time and across places and spaces. This insight allows geographers to use the past as a clue to comprehending what may be happening now and to be able to predict what might occur in the future. So the geographic advantage gives geographers important roles to play in providing insights into key events unfolding on our planet today. Challenges to how to understand and respond to environmental change. How to promote sustainability by thinking about how and where 10 billion people will live. And how we're going to sustainably feed all of these people in the years ahead. And another issue, what is the relationship between where we live and our health? Or the movement of flow and flow of people, goods and ideas. How are these changing the world? How is economic globalization affecting inequality, economic inequality, gender inequality, social inequality? Or how geopolitical shifts influence peace and stability at a range of levels, from neighborhoods to communities to countries to the globe. So these are all topics that you'll grapple with throughout this course. And if you can think of me as kind of a Darth Vader character, I would say, let the geographic advantage, the geographer's force, guide you and be with you as you go through the rest of your study of human geography. But this discussion is at a rather large and abstract scale. What could it mean for you as a member of society or of a specific community? Let me give you an idea of how the geographic advantage plays out in one place. In unit six, you're going to learn about the practice of redlining, a, system, a tool of systemic racism that discouraged people of color from being able to get home mortgages to secure safe and adequate housing. This map from 1939 shows the areas in red in Los Angeles where banks could not or would not loan money for mortgages. Although this was banned, this practice of redlining was banned at least 50 years ago, the policy persists today in patterns of segregation. And note here what we're doing is we're thinking uh, through a map to uncover patterns that, to help us understand the processes at play in society. As a result, there are distinct patterns in the landscape. Poor Black and Latino communities have fewer trees and less shade than other neighborhoods. This is especially acute as climate change raises temperatures and urban areas become more vulnerable to heat waves, so-called urban heat islands. Google urban heat island and redlining if you're interested in this phenomenon. There are a number of stories about it currently. Or you can check out this website um, to explore patterns in your own community using maps and geographic information systems. But as reported by Dr. Don Wright, who's the chief scientist of ESRI, which is the world's largest provider of environment of, uh, excuse me, geographic information systems, with a sense of urgency, the city of Los Angeles is addressing the issue of hot urban places by collaborating with a uh, provider, uh, ESRI, as well as Cal State Los Angeles, its students and local NGOs to collect and use data and geospatial technologies to solve this equity issue. Who has great trees and green spaces 
and who does not. And mapping the data makes the patterns clear. As students taking a GIS class discovered by comparing maps showing redlining and urban temperature differences. They self-organized into a group called the Social Equity Engagement Geodata Data Scholars, or SEEDS, and embedded themselves in local nonprofits and used the geographic advantage of spatial analysis to begin to plan for the development of a new urban forest, primarily in low-income communities and communities of color in Los Angeles, greening the city through spatial data. They're using quantitative data and GIS to figure out the best strategies and policies to plant trees in heat impacted areas. And they're collecting qualitative data, listening to community residents and using their perspectives in other projects as well. So this is all to say that thinking geographically can offer you real intellectual opportunities. Developing this geographic habit of mind in, is part of what you're going to gain from studying human geography. But this is not just about passing the exam in May, although it is important that you strive to pass the exam in May. Consider studying human geography as a potential lifelong learning opportunity, a career opportunity in the long run should you care to study geography at an institution with a geography to program. As you can see on this slide, whether you're interested in business, government, or industry, there are a range of careers possible from economic development to planning, to site location, to environmental planning, monitoring, and mediation, a lot of careers uh, for you possibly using the geographic advantage. A second excellent source on careers in geography is the American Association of Geographers, which has rich resources and videos on internships, job opportunities in geography. The geographic advantage can pay off whether you use it to make wise personal decisions, such as when you participate in civic activities, such as voting, or choosing where you live or not to live, or as you develop your perspective in terms of what you might want to do with the rest of your life. I hope you enjoy developing your geographic habit of mind and relish in thinking geographically. Thanks for your attention and enjoy human geography.